Um, and went and I had this chat with some of the technical program managers and product managers at Twitter to try and understand, you know, what were they doing? And I came out of this meeting and I was just like, gosh, this is like, this is really chaos. Welcome to Robert in Podcast brought to you by Studio Alpha, an accelerator for software startups. My name is Fabian. As you know, the big problems in this world can only be solved by entrepreneurs like our guest today, Nick Modul. Welcome, Nick. Fabian, thanks so much for having me. Um, I was very excited to have this today with you. How was the winter in, uh, how, how was the winter, by the way, in, in Australia? Mate, um, today it's actually, it's quite beautiful blue sky and I rode my bicycle to work yesterday. It is a little bit cold, maybe 15 degrees. Ooh, okay. What's yeah. the temperature in San Diego today? It's a, it's like uh, in the last day, it's pretty const constantly around 20 degrees. We had some warmer days. It was like 25, 24. It's always, you know, wind from, from the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's very nice. Beautiful. Yes. Literally. <laughs> Love it. So, so give me, um, a little bit of background about you, Nick Maldun, uh, is a passionate professional whose mission is to help companies around the world grow effectively. He currently serves as the co-CEO of Easy Agile, a company he co-founded that is dedicated to delivering solutions to help agile teams to be agile. Under his leadership, Easy Agile has developed popular products such as user story maps for Jira and roadmaps for Jira. These tools have been adopted by a wide range of high profile clients, including BMW, Twitter, Cisco, NetApp, Bloomberg, or Bosch. Before Easy Agile, Nick, held significant roles at Twitter and Atlassian. We'll get to it in a minute. Outside his work with Easy Agile, Nick has contributed significantly to the tech community. He co-founded the Silicon, not Silicon, the Silicon Valley community in January 2016 with the aim of bringing together the local tech, entrepreneur and creative communities in Wollongong in Australia. Additionally, Nick co-organized the San Francisco Agile Marketing Meetup, growing it to become the largest marketing meetup in the Bay Area. You know, even me was once with you um, at eBay, when eBay made one of these uh, um, Agile Marketing Meetups. I can remember very well. So apart from his passion for community engagement, Nick is also known for helping others succeed in their professional endeavor so facing this impressive cv in one sentence nick what was the key mo moment or decision that has shaped your career trajectory mm, i love it uh and it comes to me immediately um so there's a publication in australia the Australian Financial Review. And I used to, and I still read this publication on a daily basis. Um, it's a broadsheet newspaper. And in mid 2007, when I was finishing my university degree, I saw an article and it was just a, a sidebar article. It wasn't like a full page article. It was just a sidebar article. And it was talking about this Australian software company that was selling to the US Department of Defense. And at the time, I was, I was aware that having a security clearance was um, a way that you could accelerate your career. Because if you got a security clearance, you know, there was only so many people that had a security clearance and, and so on and so forth. And I was like, oh, Australian software company that's selling to the US Department of Defense. I'm going to get a job there. I'll get a security clearance. And, um, and that'll be like, that'll kickstart my career. Now, it didn't turn out like that. There was no security clearance because, you know, US Department of Defense was one of thousands of customers that Atlassian had. 
but joining Atlassian in those early days was really a great accelerator for my career. And um, and over my time at Atlassian, I had so many wonderful people leaders that invested their time and energy in accelerating my career, and that was that was just fantastic. Yeah, so that's probably the it immediately comes to mind, Fabian, and that'd be the most impactful thing. What year was that? That was in 2007. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So very early on. Yeah. So you know that we started working with Atlassian in 2004 when there were like 25 people. We were back then five people. And in 2006, we became the first official um, partner worldwide, you know. And then yeah. one year later, you, you went, um, you, you came to Atlassian. Yeah. So, um, you know, there is something I can re remember very well. And again and again, I ask this question to myself, like, let's say every two or three months, at least. Okay. And I have to go back when we met first, when we first met at the coffee shop yes. across the market street of Twitter. Yeah. There yeah. was a small Marvelous. coffee shop. You remember? Marvelous, it was exactly. Marvelous. Yeah, I remember. I the best hot chocolates in San Francisco. Exactly. I just wanted to say I had a, an espresso <laughs> and you had a hot chocolate. And then we, we met the first time. We haven't met at Atlassian. So basically, in Atlassian, I, I thought it was Jose. He opened door to you, okay? Because mm -hmm. I, I was uh, I was on the mission to find new speakers for World War Four, and then he said, "Let me introduce you to Nick. It's the Agile Coach at Twitter." So we met in this coffee the first time ever and we said hello um you asked me what i want to drink you was, was uh, explaining the gorgeous hot chocolate in this coffee do you came back with these uh, beverages and then you didn't say how are you or something like that you just asked me right away no introduction hey fabian how you make sure that your company is effective and I have to admit, so I, I must admit I was taken a bank. So the goal in this podcast is that every founder, entrepreneur of listening to the pod, to, to this podcast has now time to think about his own or her own answer to this question while we building this up. And at the end, you have to explain, you know, what pattern, what methodology you approach the answer to this question, okay? Okay. Cool. So um, given your expertise in agile practices, let's delve into um, that a little deeper now. First and foremost, can you explain agile methodology in a nutshell? Yeah, um, look, the, the big thing behind agile is this desire and curiosity to find a better way to do things or an opportunity to improve and and if you think like i i think about um like agile is this umbrella term and there's a whole lot of practices and 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 principles that kind of come underneath it and you've you've probably heard of practices such as scrum and kanban there's the lean principles there's movements like devops but at the end of the day this everything under this agile umbrella is in service of finding better ways to do things on an ongoing basis. The, the reason being, whatever you're doing today, it's not perfect. Whatever you're doing today, there's a slightly better way or there's a much better way that you could do it. And so if you're curious and you're prepared to experiment and try something different, you'll find an even better way to do what you're doing. And why? who wouldn't want that, right? Who wouldn't want that? So that's the thing that underpins all of this conversation about agility. Um, I think the other thing to say is that um, quite often people look at other companies or other teams and they want to replicate what that other company or team has done. But I can't, I can't take your customers, your team, your contract negotiation process and apply it to my business. Because they're, you know, they're different businesses and culturally they're different businesses. And so each business, each organization 
has to kind of find its own pathway, its own rhythm and navigate that. And they can use all of this other perspective and learn from everyone else. But at the end of the day, it'll be something that's a unique journey for them to getting that agility. And so simply spoken, Scrum or Kanban are just methodologies to exactly achieve what you explain. They can That's be other. Correct, yeah. You can you, basically you can make up your own uh, methodology to improve yeah. what you're doing on a daily basis. But um, these are just like two famous ones, correct? Right? Yeah, and and if you look at like there's the Scrum and Kanban, there's been a lot written about those. If you look at Salesforce in 2006, the team at Salesforce came up with the adaptive delivery model, and Chris Fry and Steve Green wrote about that in a paper. Um, and the adaptive delivery model was based on Scrum, but it was like the Salesforce version of that. And then at Twitter, we had our own version. Um, and, and you know, so like everyone's, but there's a lot of companies that'll say, oh, we've heard about the Spotify model and we'll take the Spotify model and we'll apply it. But taking a model from, you know, a Northern European technology company that's only been around for, you know, 10 or 15 years and applying it to a 150 year old bank in Germany, that's you know, that's got a very different culture. That's got tens of thousands of people. It kind of doesn't make sense. Um, and so, yeah, learn from these different approaches and the perspective of others, but try and find your own path and your own journey. Okay, let's talk about this own journey of Atlassian back the days. Mm. So when Atlassian was a startup, a startup itself, and how did the you know the agile methodology shaped the company's fast growth and product development, which is core of their success. How did they yeah. do that? Well, I mean, first thing is we just didn't talk about agile, right? So there's these companies today that have been crafted, created, and grown in an agile world, and so they don't talk about agile software development they just talk about software development because they never you know there's a whole there's a whole co like i've never worked in a waterfall environment i've seen them i've visited them as a guest um but i've never actually worked in one and so um i'm an agile native leader and atlassian you know mike and scott they were agile native they are agile native leaders they never worked in a waterfall environment and so for them and the early days of, of Atlassian, we didn't talk about agile and agility. We just had this regular cadence of shipping bug fixes and features and improvements to the customers because that was the lifeblood. You didn't have, you know, remember this is before Atlassian got the big injection of capital from a cell, right? So it was a, it was a bootstrapped company. It was customer funded. And if you didn't respond to your customers, you didn't have a business. And so naturally, because you don't have the wherewithal of a bigger, more established software company behind you, like a Microsoft or an Oracle, you have to find a way to be continually responding to what your customer needs are. And, um, and, and Mike and Scott not having any experience with Waterfall, they just found this, this iterative model of listen to customers on jira.atlassian.com and get all the feedback and then take that feedback and build a release or a version of software and then ship it and rinse and repeat. And so they were just agile natives. Um, and what we're doing for a lot of our companies around the world today that are larger companies, those Fortune 500 companies, those Forbes Global 2000 companies, they've been around for the most part for over 50 years, over 30 years. And they started in that waterfall mindset. And so we're trying to educate the leaders of these companies that aren't agile natives. We're trying to educate them about lean principles and agile practices. Whereas the next generation of leaders that are coming through, your daughter, you know, the education that she's got, she's never going to go into a waterfall environment. No. And she's going to be an agile native leader as she goes through the business. Yeah, they have, they have at least here in the States, they had a, a class for design thinking. Mm. There you go. So and and there, yeah. So and they start this early on, yeah. So um, yeah, that's interesting what you say because uh, talking about uh, this, you know, before we got started with this uh, recording, this podcast, we we're talking about 
this neighbor couple, surfer couple that has a baby. Yeah, this baby is super agile. The way it, okay. you know, it way the way it tries to improve on a daily basis is super yeah. agile. So when you go back to Mike and Scott, as far as I can remember, Mike definitely, Scott, I'm not sure, but basically they were not um, experienced workers. They came basically out out of their um, um, study. So University. they didn't yeah. exactly. So they didn't really know how prof, you know professionally. Uh, work so the only way you can do it is try out trial and error that's and, it absolutely and you make a lot of mistakes and then um you realize quickly and improve yeah and but that's and basically the natural things. way of go of solving problems isn't it that you're absolutely right but keep in mind and i'm sure we'll get to this but like being a bootstrapped company when you make those mistakes, you're making mistakes with your own money. As distinct from venture funded companies, when they make mistakes, they make mistakes with other people's money, right? And so your, your incentive to improve and find opportunities to improve when you're using your own money and you're putting your own money at risk every day, like there's, there's a strong alignment there between incentives and improvement. Yes, and and yeah, that's that's the famous um, arguments of the anti agile community is when you are brain search, when you're a doctor doing a brain surgery, or when you're a pilot in a in a in a in a, in a plane, you you don't want to be them uh, being agile with you. No, okay. and in fact, you know, I'll give you a, a sidebar. Uh, one of my one of my great mates longest mates that i've ever had from preschool he's a pilot and he's a pilot on the boeing 747 and he's just retrained in the last few years to the boeing 787 and i ask him this question i'm like can you get in a can you get in a boeing c-130 you know army transport aircraft and fly that and he's like no i'm like surely it's all the same because i could take a software engineer from one team and put them on another team and there'd be a bit of an adjustment, but he's like, no, like the systems for flying a plane are so involved. I do like I do, you know, a year of training to be able to fly a plane. And so it's, it, that's a very different industry to the one that mm -hmm. we're fortunate to be in, in the world of software. Exactly. So and, and we are focusing software startups, right? And software, um, uh, software companies. Um, so when we, you know, talking about this, so we, so first of all, you know, um, at that last scene, you worked as a product ma um, uh, uh, manager, product manager, as a product in, in product marketing, in program management, and you were an agile coach. And at last scene, it's known for its culture. Don't fuck the, uh, don't fuck the client. Um, we work as a team and so on. How did this aspect interact with agile practices at the company or in other terms for young founders, how important are values are that you yourself um, are going to establish in your company? Um, and um, you know, how does, how important are these values that you can form your own agile approaches? Is it something yeah, that, we, you know, you just have to try also with the culture or is culture something waterfall like? Well, I guess it comes down to the, the history of the company. You know, if I think about 3M, you know, 3M's been in the manufacture of chemicals for 100 years now, but 3M had a physical office environment and a culture that opened them up, you know, 80 years ago, 60, 70, 80 years ago, to these opportunistic conversations between team members in different departments. And that's how they arrived at things like the post-it note. You know, they have the sticky compound and someone's, you know, taken various sticky compounds and they've just found one that's the right, you know, tactile, kind of nature for for bits of paper and um so i think you know that and i imagine i imagine i don't have first-hand experience but i imagine that getting something to market at 3m 
was a very waterfall exercise. <laughs> but they obviously had a value around innovation and experimentation, and they set aside time for that. And, um, and so I won't say that there's a direct, you know, that you have to be agile to find innovation and to find these opportunities to innovate, because I don't think that's the case. But I just feel like there are opportunities to do this faster and be more responsive to an ever-changing market if you're in an if you have that agile mindset and your culture kind of encourages and embraces agility and wants to experiment is happy to fail because that's the key thing right like if we think back to thomas edison with the light bulb like how many times did he fail he failed a ten thousand times in making the light bulb but he kind of brute forced it and he got there or you think about spacex and the number of times that spacex failed that's remarkable you know, with with fifty hundred million dollar rockets, and they just blew up on the launch pad, or they landed and they blew up. Like that's a lot of capital to put at work, but they brute forced it. And so, for some yeah. of these industries, you kind of just have to push through and brute force it. In the world of software, it's so cheap to experiment and fail and go on again. Like you've got no reason not to. I think this uh, SpaceX uh, example that's also remarkable because i w could have never imagined that before elon musk just um had this agile approach also with rockets um they they launched this huge mm -hmm. the, the, the biggest rocket they have that is so, so crucial to then you know get the whole material logistics up to the moon and um it exploded in the press wall street journal financial times and so on they basically were a little bit yeah look um they failed you know between the lines they failed the rocket exploded but mm. that was not the case for for spacex itself it was just about can we bring that rocket off the ground before it explodes mm. so they really got trial and error and then when it mm. when it was like was airborne and started flying they hit even the second record and it went so far that was a huge success for spacex but you can see that brings the, the biggest media companies they they have experts they have people analysts you know they covering spacex for years and they, they didn't know how to um make the interpretation about this agile approach yeah, yeah. no you're spot on and i think Look, it, it, NASA would never get the NASA would never get the opportunity from a U.S. Cr congressional and a budget perspective to have taxpayer money blow up on the launch pad again and again and again. So again, there's like there's this funding piece, and how do you fund something? And in the private markets, you know, SpaceX has got this private funding. And the risk appetite of the people that are funding it is very high. They're really willing to take a lot of risk. Whereas the, the Congressional Budget Office that provides funding to NASA or however that works, like the risk appetite is way low. Like they don't want to have NASA blowing up rockets on the launch pad every second month. Whereas SpaceX going, what do we care? Private company. You know, so again, yeah. it's like it's that culture and values and how does it fit? But nevertheless, by exactly this agile approach they have developed themselves in these innovations within the technology development extremely much faster than nasa could ever ex yeah. Um, imagine so, yeah absolutely yeah talking about elon <laughs> you then you then you left atlassian and yeah. you started working as an agile coach um at twitter how come you know what how did that happen twitter asking you or you just were fed up with atlassian we're looking around yeah so um no i wasn't fed up with atlassian at all um atlassian was a great learning experience of, of how to scale a company um and i went to visit twitter uh to see if i could do a case study because they were one of our customers and i wanted to learn you know the new hotness right like twitter was on the ascendancy a lot of noise i'm like gosh if we could do a twitter case study that would be really interesting for our broader customer base um and went and i had this chat with some of the technical program managers and product managers at twitter to try and understand you know what were they doing 
And I came out of this meeting and I was just like, gosh, this is like, this is really chaos. And so a lot of agile <laughs> transformations, like we talk about agile transformations or this journey to agility, and they're coming from waterfall, you know, a very command and control kind of leadership or management style you know, stage gate releases, they're coming from this waterfall world and they're trying to get towards agility and bring agility in. But Twitter was like right at the other end of the spectrum. I mean, it was complete and utter chaos. And Twitter was trying to bring a little bit of structure and process into place while the company was going from, you know, 50 to 100 million to 150 million to 200 million monthly active users, right? And so it was trying to actually bring a semblance of stability and process and, and move away from some of this chaotic kind of approach to delivery. And so it was a very different journey from what had been written about at large. Um, and anyway, I had this conversation and, and was, was invited to come back and continue the conversation later um, and was subsequently offered a role there um, to help try and address some of these challenges. But really, if we come back to the, like the culture and the like, it, it starts at the top. And so, if if there's no long term strategy for how we kind of carve out what is our space to play in the world and what do we want to achieve and what's that north star, then there's kind of like this whiplash. And I think that's what we faced at Twitter a lot: is we would make an acquisition, invest in an acquisition, shut down an acquisition, make another acquisition that was kind of similar to that acquisition invest in it shut it down like we really didn't know there wasn't like this guiding north star and um and so i think that was a really kind of challenging time in twitter's life to go from a private company where it didn't really matter and money was free because venture capitalists and private equity were throwing you know throwing gobs of money at the business to grow it um into one that's a public company and suddenly you've got other people kind of critiquing the numbers and questioning the numbers and, and asking, well, how are you going to take all, you've taken all of our money now. How do we get a return on it? You know, you're losing so much money. How do we get a return on it? And so the, how the business navigated from a high growth private company to what was not a high growth public company with a whole lot of, um, They're profit oriented. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd like to say profit oriented, but even just like sustainable growth, you know, it just didn't make that transition effectively. It was a really tricky one to navigate. Um, in the first 12 months at Twitter, like we added over a thousand software engineers, like go back to that thing about brute forcing it. It was just like brute force the problem, just hire more software engineers, hire more software engineers. And you get into these conversations, Fabian, and you go, but what are we going to do with all these people? Don't worry. Don't worry. We'll figure that out once we've got them. Like, gosh, could we have a bit of it? Like, could I have a clue? You know, it'd be really handy to know what we want to kind of pursue so that we understand the capabilities that we want to bring in rather than just like bringing in more capacity. Um, so I think the way that, that the business kind of scaled up was a bit, it was it was not the most effective way to scale up there you go so you in, in the beginning you made this uh, example that you cannot copy agile methodologies for instance from uh, spotify to deutsche bank okay mm. but in this case from you know from a closer perspective this the difference between atlassian software engineering they build a software product and Twitter, they have a software platform. Basically, they have also software products. They're very similar. Could you, mm. could you um, take over these methodologies learned or established by Atlassian? Could you take over these or did you have to start from scratch? Oh, no, no, you're right. You definitely can. You can definitely borrow. I mean, there's some teams at Twitter where just having a very I would say a very standard scrum approach with one or two week sprints, just help them get away from that chaos, like that whiplash of, you know, things are changing all the time and just try and actually carve out a one or two week block where they can focus on something and get something done. Great. Like that's a really quick win for that team. And then we can go from there. 
Um, for other teams, it was just about recognizing that they were always in flow and that if someone's coming to them and asking them or telling them that this is the new urgency, then the team has a Kanban board and they say, okay, well, if this is a new emergency, what do you want me to give up? Because you can't expect me to do the five things that I've got on my list and this new emergency. So if, if this is truly an emergency, that's fine, but I'm going to take these five things off and I'm going to put them back in to do and I'm going to focus on the emergency. And then, of course, the, the, the inevitable response is, no, I need you to do these five things and the emergency. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's not possible. It's not possible, right? Like the context switching from one thing to the other, it's just I'm not going to get anything done. And so we actually yeah. had to get into the habit of using a lot of data to demonstrate. So data was respected. And so we would, you know, as, as, have a, this as conversation. A controlling. So the data to, to then have to prove what yeah. the effectivity was. That's correct. Yeah. So we would, we would measure and we would, we would share back that data and say, okay, like you, you can call a code red. It's called a, like a code red, right? You can call a code red and this is a big problem, but here's what we see when you call a code red. All of these teams over here, they suddenly deliver nothing. And we fix this problem and you fix the one problem, but now you've left 30 other teams without their senior engineers and anything that you were working on over here doesn't get delivered. So it was you know, was, did you know about that trade-off? And we were trying to help paint a picture around the trade-offs. You can make the trade-off, that's fine, but just be aware of what you're giving up. You know, you, it's not, you, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You've got to like, yeah, you've got to make a choice. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, at Twitter, there one or the there, there were one or the the other CEO, you know. That then, Jack Dorsey, back then, I think he was not CEO anymore. He was just the, the president of the board back then, right? Yeah. So in my time, there was Dick Costolo, who was the CEO, yeah. and then um, I think a week or two weeks before I finished up, Jack Dorsey came in. And it was interesting the different approach. So one of the in one of the first town halls that Jack Dorsey ran, it would have been the first and only one that I would have seen, probably. Um, but he he basically said, "Here's the list of stuff that we went through as a leadership team." So like this agile principle of transparency, like here's Jack Dorsey sharing at the leadership team. Here's all the stuff that we talked about as a leadership team, and and providing a great deal of, of openness and transparency to the rest of the company to help bring them on the journey. And so it was, it was like this night and day difference between mm. the two leadership styles. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just really interesting to see the different approaches. And then obviously now you've, you've got a very different style again with you know the two, or well, the, the most recent CEO of Twitter um, and now the new CEO of Twitter will be very different again, how they approach things. I, I, like I and what do you think? That was a question that I prepared. What do yeah. you think about the takeover by Elon Musk? Um, did you buy ultimately. Twitter shares? Did you buy Twitter shares again? Uh, no, I wouldn't, but that's probably due more to long-term trends than it is Twitter itself. Um, but I think what Elon has come in and done is probably on the whole, um, as far as shaking up and reorganizing the company is probably a good thing. I think the, the veil that he puts on it with the, um, you know, the, the political, economic, social kind of bent that he very clearly brings into that. I'm not a fan of that like if you look at jeff bezos with um the media publication that he owns washington post right like it doesn't appear to me that he comes in and he does editorial on washington post but elon musk has very clearly come in and he's put editorial on the the twitter feed and and i'm really not a fan of that um 
but I guess ultimately it's kind of it's it's a moot point. Like he's he's got an uphill battle with with Facebook or Meta or Instagram releasing an equivalent with Mastodon, you know, with the rise of TikTok. There's so many other things that are vying for people's attention today. And the a lot of the people that join Twitter for that progressive social discourse over a 10 year period have now jumped ship and gone to Mastodon. And the people that have come in their place are uh, um, have stronger um, opinions, but they're typically less well educated. And so as they are less well educated, they are not as wealthy. And because they are not as wealthy, they're not as valuable to advertisers to reach. And so I think it's like this self fulfilling prophecy that the platform Twitter itself will not be as successful long term. Not as a not in a yeah. financial sense anyway, and not in a relevant sense. Yeah, let's see. So he's a very capable founder and CEO. Um, now he has again, you know, like with uh, SpaceX and um, Tesla, he has hired a female CEO, Linda Chacarino. Um, yeah, it looks like a pattern how how he approaches to turn around this company. Yeah, but I neither did I buy um, shares. Okay, so. As the last point concerning this topic, Agile, what is the biggest misconception about Agile? Oh, the biggest misconception about Agile. Um, I think historically that you like you get done. You know, you don't get done. Like it's never done. You're always <laughs> you're always working at it. I think about um, there's an amazing woman that you might like to have on to talk like really deeply about Agile. Her name's Kelly Courier. And Kelly was the agile practice lead at Salesforce for, I think, over a decade, um, if I'm not mistaken. You know, and it's a journey that 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 companies are kind of always on. You know, we used to talk about a transformation and transformation implying that you've got like this binary thing, like you're not agile, now you're agile. But in reality, like what we've discovered is that for any company of any or any organization of any meaningful size, you're taking steps every single day to help that company get closer to achieving agility. And then when you get there, your leadership changes, like we've just talked about, like Elon Musk is out and, and you know, Laura's in and, and at Twitter and, and now you've kind of got to start again because the new leader's got a new style. Um, and so, you know, and all of the changes that come out of that with the reorgs and whatever else. So I think, you know, the misconception is that you get done with this and you move on to the next thing the reality is you're never done with this and it's a journey that your organization is always on to attain greater and greater levels of agility okay so so Makes basically sense. fabian don't get frustrated if you don't feel like you're making progress because like you you over the long term you will probably be making progress it's again like steve jobs always said it's perseverance Mm -hmm. So if if you he had to he, he was asked in an interview just in one in a nutshell you know what makes a successful entrepreneur and he said it's perseverance mm. talk about perseverance in the sense of completeness in this first meeting when we met you asked me Fabian why are you not charging for JSU <laughs> I love it. Fabian, oh, it's just so beautiful reminiscing. I love it. And I said, they they don't want us to charge. And who was the name of the responsible person for the for the um, uh, um, marketplace? It was this triathlete, also from Sydney. I, I, I liked him a lot. What was his name? Brian Rollins. Brian exactly. Rollins. He's absolutely exactly. wonderful. And, and he wasn't yeah, responsible for the marketplace. He didn't want us to charge. He, he, huh? Yeah. Yeah, he, he was responsible for Jira. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This question so good. turned around turned around everything in our company. You know, and we had you know we had we needed our time to get first internally to like to say look this app is not just marketing for us. It's more, you know. It was early on. In the market space, so they were, you know, and, the majority and, of and all Fabian, this app, app. 
you you remember when you actually launched it and you started charging for it and you remember how much money you made that first month yeah it was the and i fucked money you know, i machine. fell off my chair it was like <laughs> that's just, it was this particular question so when i i asked chat gpt you know i i feed the chat gpt okay and and i can now browse I, I, of course you use chat gpt too and then it came the first thing it came up for you is that you help companies to grow uh, effectively okay and this is exactly what you did by asking me this question thank you very much one more time so now Diving. we are we, we go into this we go into this topic now startups right um you started several companies as as we did and um um so you have you have a wealth of experience in building and scaling companies that's basically something that's your speciality i think uh, and especially as i mentioned that it can also help others um but let's talk about your own company right now that you are a co-ceo is the agile um everything so is are you are you happy with the growth you have generated in the past and is your perspective into the future are you um are, are you content with with your ability to help others to grow effectively um with yourself are you as content with yourself doing this oh um no probably not I don't think I'm ever content with myself because go back to agility. I, I always look at myself and reflect and I go, it could be better. I could improve here. I could improve there. And so I don't feel that I'm ever content. I think of one of the things that Dave and I, Dave's, Dave Elkins, my co-founder, co-CEO here. Um, and Dave and I, I think we both have a similar trait in that we're never, we're never happy. Um, we, you know, we, we kind of get to a milestone and we go like any, anyone else. And this was up. too weak. That was too, this, this dark, this objective was not, was not, was not high enough. Yeah. And, and there's this, there's this quote that I've got written under my monitor and it's, I didn't come this far to only go this far. And I really like that quote because I remember sitting down with Edwin Wong and he's one of the heads of product at Atlassian. And Paul Slade, who was one of the engineering directors at Atlassian, and this is going back 15 years. And Paul, who at the time was in his early 40s, was asking Edwin and I in our mid 20s, he's like, like, where to from here? Like you two, you run, you run Jira and you run Jira software. Like this is like the pinnacle of someone's career. Where are you going to go from here? And it's like, well, this is just, we're just getting started, right? Like I don't want to, I want to go and see the world and I want to, you know, have different experiences. And how fortunate that I got to go to San Francisco and spend time obviously with you and your crew in Zurich. And, um, you know, like there's so much that I want to do. And so I, I, it's, it's like, it's always day one. And that's something I took from Amazon, right? It's always day one. And, you know, where to from here? So I didn't come this far to only go this far. And there's something greater that I can look forward to around the corner. Might not know what that is yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm on that journey. Yeah, so just that the listeners know you're very successful. So your apps are close to JSU, which is still one of the best. And um, so you, you have had a tremendously quick growth in your own company. How many oh, yeah. people are you today? Today we are 45 people. Um, and you're I'm bootstrapped. Proud to say we're bootstrapped and I'm proud to say that we've been profitable since inception um we pay dividends and so we've taken a different approach to many of our peers in um in the technology space in that we didn't take other people's money to grow the business um not to say that we won't but it's been the journey that we've been on thus far um yeah it's been a pretty good journey it's been pretty pretty good congratulations congratulations Thanks, very good job yeah yeah so so you know what it's also something that I always think about. And also 
there are people asking me from time to time, how did you do, you know, um, make this growth happen? And I, it's still hard to really explain why that happened. It was your question, basically, you know, but you know, there, there are other things. So this is the secret of success. What are the core elements? What you think for, for um, uh, uh, um, Easy Agile that you have based on your whole CV that we have been talking about now, um, you started by like zero on the ground and you, you guys just paid everything by yourself, no investors, and you were able to grow that quickly. Okay. Um, what are, is the, the secret of success? Um, I make no secret of my success. The secret of my success personally is that I had a fantastic start in life. I was super lucky to be born in Australia. Australia has a great social safety net. Um, I was born to well-educated parents, both of whom were professionals. So my mum worked in um, recruitment and executive recruitment and my dad was an entrepreneur. Um, and that was their career. And my dad was, he would run a software company and he owned a pub, you know, that, that he worked at nights and weekends, a pub. Yeah. And so like I won, like this, the, the not secret of my life is I won the lottery, you know, like I, I had two highly educated parents that provided a great education for me and provided, a, a great environment for me to be exposed to different ideas. Right. Like I, I, I used to get the fortune, like my dad got the financial review and delivered every day and got the fortune magazine delivered every month. And so I would read fortune cover to cover. I would read to the financial review cover to cover. I had to read, I had to read the front page of the financial review before breakfast, you know, to my dad when I was 10 or 12 years old. Right. So like there was always this interest in reading and this curiosity. And so that's like, you know, full credit to my mum, Sandra, and my dad, Peter, and, and, you know, like my school education at Redlands and all that sort of stuff. But that's given me the foundation to build upon and have a really successful okay. life. Yeah. And, and the company itself, Easy Agile, what is the secret of success in this startup? The, the quick growth. Uh, no, let's, like, like in a nutshell, to be a successful founder, you, have to be able to grow your tech company quickly. How do you, how do you do that? Um, I would say that for us, like there's a great balance between Dave and I in our approaches. So Dave comes from an engineering background. I come from a product background. Um, like we balance one another really well. And, and I think we have, I don't think we, have very lavish lifestyles and i think we're you know we're fairly boring all things considered um but what we do uh -huh. know is we know um we know what we're not good at and so we've we've brought on people that make the business more effective right like we have talia who's our head of people and culture and she knows the world of people and culture inside out We've got Derek, who's our head of product, and he knows product practice inside out. We've got Fernanda, who's our head of engineering, and she knows how to scale an engineering organization inside out. So we don't believe that we are great at any of these things. We believe that we are sufficiently good at these things to find the people that are great at these things. And, and, you know, and then just like trust them, get out of their way and let them run with it. Like that's the approach. Okay, so um, thank you very much for your time, Nick. Um, let's circle back to the beginning. Um, how do you make sure that your company is effective? I make sure that Easy Agile is effective by checking in with our people from top to bottom and asking them where we can improve and how we can improve and listening to their feedback and giving them the time and the space to actually go and implement and experiment with these changes that they want to make and give them the freedom to fail. That's how I make sure that our company is effective.
Thank you, Nick. Take care. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Please write comments, thumbs up or down, subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Fabian. Ciao. Ciao, Tang. So tell hey, me, what, what are we talking about today?